The man was drunk out of his mind when his mother led him to the car. She knew, given history, that he would pass out in the back seat like he had every other time. So she helped him to the car and they set out to drive home. This wasn't an isolated occurrence. It happened every time he traveled. He would sleep most of the way home, and then she would, when they got close, she would let him know about 15 minutes out that they were getting close to home so that he could wake up enough to be able to navigate from the car to the front door of his house to his bed where he would pass out again. And that night, she passed a familiar scene, a small airport, and she noticed a familiar light from the control tower at the airport. And she told him, I just saw the light at the airport, and son, you need to wake up. <coughs> and the 23-year-old young man crawled over the front seat, plopped down beside his mother, grabbed a pen and a piece of paper, and wrote a song on the way from the airport to the house. That young man was Hank Williams Sr. And that song was one of the most famous songs of the last century in the gospel world, I Saw the Light. <laughs> now, I'm not giving you a license to write him to be hungover with a headache. Please don't hear that. But what I am suggesting is that this story illustrates a deep spiritual point, and that is even in our darkness, we can see light. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. That's the sermon today. No more darkness, no more night. I saw the light. Now, over the years, I've noticed that us Episcopalians, we have a particular way of interpreting this passage. It's always fascinating to me how various Christians and various denominations, uh, they, they see the scriptures and they interpret them through their own theological, political, sociological lens. I mean, you do know that old joke about the Episcopal tradition, right? Uh, how many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? Well, that's easy. It takes three. It takes one to change the light bulb. It takes one to go get the wine and the cheese and the crackers. And then it takes another one, the final one, to talk about how much he really missed the old light bulb. <laughs> Say amen or oh me. When we hear, you're the light of the world, we usually hear it as an ethical challenge. We hear it as a way of life, a system, if you will. A way to discern right and wrong, a way to treat people well and not. And we use that to develop what I've called holy virtues. To shine that light of inclusion, of hospitality, of acceptance, the light of God's love, and to shine the light of social mercy. Now let me just stop right here and ask a very important question. Do you know which promise in the baptismal covenant that is extremely popular in the Episcopal Church? See, at baptism, the priest takes the person, or if it's a child, people speak on behalf of the person, takes them to the font. Their family is there, and the congregation is there as well. And that's, that, that sacrament has five questions associated with it. We always talk about, one, when you respect the dignity of every human being. And we quote that, rightly so, in defense of the marginalized and those on the fringes. Those whom prejudice has wounded and hurt and run away from our houses of worship. But do we know those other four promises that we make when we are at the baptismal font. I will confess to you, when I was working on this sermon, I could only name four of the five. But here's one of the other ones. Will you seek 
and serve Christ in all persons? Will you intentionally look into another person and find God's fingerprint of love in them? Will you extend the same hospitality to them as much as you hope to stay for them as you would for Jesus? Now, well, I wish the baptismal covenant would ask something hard of me. <laughs> you know, us Episcopalians, we, uh, we know all about asking hard things. It's, I mean, you know the old story. How many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? Well, it takes two. <laughs> One to ask the important question. Which light bulb? Well, who donated the light bulb? Is there a plaque associated with the light bulb? <laughs> We get offended if anyone removes the light bulb that someone's great grandmother gives the light bulb. Who changes the light bulbs around here anyway? Where's the ladder to change the light bulbs? Who's in charge of this particular ladder? Is there a plaque on that ladder? Changing this light bulb is just too complicated. We need to form a light bulb committee to figure it out. It's quiet. This passage does challenge us. Challenges us to purposefully serve Christ in others, no matter of their persuasion or if we like them or not. Love your neighbors as yourselves. So we hear in this passage, there's a challenge, a way of life, a way to treat people. But here's another way to see it. It's a pronouncement of who we are. Sometimes when I study the scriptures, I find it helpful to know what Jesus did not say. He did not say, you can be the light of the world. You, you're capable of, if you just work hard enough, if, if you get all that sin out of your life, then, then you can be the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. That Greek word there, Amy, it, it literally means to exist without explicit time limitations or stratifications. So you're the light of the world, whether you like it or not, without any limitations. And when he says that, he confronts a threat, a demon, if you will, that so many of us battle every day of our lives. He speaks to the intricate recesses of the soul, the space where our insecurities and our addictions and our secrets, our rage, our wounds, where they, those things reside, the spaces of ourselves that we hide, the darkness inside. Jesus speaks to that, and he declares an identity over us. You are the light of the world. It sounds to me like he's saying, you do not have to wonder anymore if you are worthless or if you are unworthy of God's love or if you're beautiful or if God is mad at you or if God is punishing you. You do not have to worry if God forgives you. You do not have to worry if one mistake defines who you are. You can release yourself from that jail cell and you can be who God calls you to be. One light shining in the darkness can change the world. Shining in the light is not something we do. It's who we are. When the light comes on, we can often see ourselves differently than before. It's like that old funny bit on Looney Tunes that I remember as a child. When Bugs Bunny strolls into the office he sits down and he lays back on the psychiatrist's chair and, and the good doctor, he, well, what brings you in today? And Bug says, well, doc, there's something bad wrong. I'm having delusions. I'm having all kinds of delusions. I'm having delusions of adequacy. <laughs> when the light came on, he realized who he was. Question for you. How can knowing who we are inform our spirituality and our relationships? It allows us to engage them in a very different way 
a different approach to one another as we probably had before. See, we're the light of the world. We are the city on a hill. And that is a divine challenge, and that is a declaration and a promise of our personhood. There's one more little thing that I want to share. It's very subtle, but that is that holy community, us, the body of Christ, is fuel for light. Now, this weekend, we had diocesan convention over at the cathedral, and we watched a, a video that Bishop Curry sent us, uh, our particular diocese, and he, he spoke about doing this E-word again. He just will not hush about the E-word, evangelism. And then Bishop Kendrick gets up in his address, and he talks about evangelism. And then he gave us some statistics that our diocese is one of the few in the Episcopal Church that's grown the last two years straight. If we will live our call to be the light of the world, God will take care of the rest of it. Rachel Remen, MD, recalled an event in her book, My Grandfather's Blessing. And it shows the power, the transformation that light can bring. Rachel says that medical professionals have a hard time sharing their feelings, end quote. She, she, so to, to help them, she holds retreats to assist caregivers to open up about their experiences. And she says, it's challenging to get them to open up, but it's even more challenging to get them to share stories about their vocations, the, the why I went into the medical field. And she said there was one particular retreat that was very difficult. Everyone was shut down, they were closed off, and they were not going to participate. They were guarded and they would not allow themselves to be made vulnerable under any circumstances at all. On that particular retreat, she said that she asked the participants to bring an item or an object with them that symbolized their understanding of their calling, their vocation. And a young nurse named Ken shyly brought a candle. And she got stuck with, the, with going first. She had to share in this group of eight people. So she took her candle she walked to the center of the room and she put it in the center of the table. It was unlit. And she stared at it for a solid minute. And then she lit it. And she said to those medical professionals, this represents my true self. This is why I went into the medical field to begin with. And then one at a time, people began to open up and share vulnerability with the others and what their vocation meant to them and how they felt called to it. And finally, a woman who was very sophisticated and an accomplished psychiatrist in the field had tears streaming down her face. And instead of using matches to light the candle that she brought, she walked over to the candle on the table. She leaned her wick over and lit her candle from the candle that was already burning and giving light. And she said, I was burned out professionally when I came. My light had gone out of my life. But her light lit mine. I walked in darkness. Clouds covered me. I had no idea what the way out could be. And then came sunrise and rolled back the night. Praise the Lord. I 